welcome to the NASA Digital Learning Network Summer of Innovation webcast series. I'm your host, Karen Long, and each week we'll be featuring a NASA expert from different NASA centers. The themes for this web series are Mother Earth, Father Sky, Rocketry, Life Science, the Universe, Aeronautics, and Robotics. Today's featured webcast comes to you live from Kennedy Space Center. Well, good afternoon to everyone watching at home. My name is Damon Talley, coming to you live from NASA's Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. And we have a great show planned for you this afternoon. Uh, we actually are going to have some wildlife in here. Uh, and part of the environmental team representing this wildlife and, and other special guests from, from your team uh, is Miss Becky Bolt. Hi, Damon. Hi. Thanks for coming here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, you're welcome. And so hopefully uh, you'll be watching at home. You actually will be able to submit those questions live via email at dln, uh, not dln.nasa.gov, actually, at uh, nasalearn at gmail.com is where you can submit those questions for us here today. nasalearn at gmail.com. And I was going to put that up for you so you can see that. There it is, Becky. Can you see that? I see it. So NASA learn at gmail.com. We can keep those questions coming in live via email. And so, Becky, what are you going to show us today? Okay, we're going to talk about the Space Center and what an incredibly special place this is. And I'm ready to start whenever, whenever you're ready. I'm a wildlife ecologist here. I've, I've been here for 23 years. And um, we do all kinds of things out here environmentally related besides just working with wildlife, and we're going to touch on, on a couple of those things. It's really going to be the tip of the iceberg, what the environmental team does here, but um, we hope to hit some highlights, so let's get started. Kennedy Space Center is 173,000 acres located on the east central coast of Florida, and it was purchased by NASA between 62, 1962 and 1964 for the space program. It's a very unique place um, physically because of the way it's, it's placed. NASA needed somewhere to launch rockets, and you don't want to do that over land where people are living. So the fact that Kennedy Space Center sticks out into the water made it very attractive for launching rockets. But it's a barrier island. That means it's uh, surrounded, mostly surrounded by water. If you look on that map, you can see the white um, areas. That's water. That's the Indian River Lagoon System, and I'll be talking more about that. We have lots of different kinds of habitats here at the Space Center. We have uplands, which are high and dry. We have wetlands, and then we have those lagoons, which are brackish water. Um, also, the thing that makes Kennedy Space Center unique is that we're in a transition zone between the temperate climates and the tropical climates. So we have lots of things that come here from both of those areas they mix here. So we have a whole lot of bio, what we call biodiversity, which means all different kinds of plants and animals. So it's, it's very unique in a lot of ways, and it's a great place to launch, and it's also a great place for natural resources. Now, this is what people think about when they think of the Space Center. They think about rockets launching and that, and we do a lot of that. That's what we're here for. But what they might not realize is of those 173,000 acres, that approximately 4.3% is actually used for space operations. And that leaves a whole lot of area that is not used for those, and it's not developed, about 165,500 acres. And those, that area is managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as wildlife habitat because part of the uniqueness of this place ecologically are the numbers of animals and, and habitats and plants that we have here that are really different. So this is managed as the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. And our claim to fame of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge is that we have 17 federally listed wildlife species, which is more than any other wildlife refuge in the continental United States. The only United States refuges that have more are in Alaska. So we're real proud of that, and it's a big responsibility for NASA. They, they realized early on in the space program that they were going to need help to, to take care of this place in the way it should be taken care of and still do their job of launching rockets. So that's our brief introduction to the Space Center and to the Wildlife Refuge. And now I'm going to welcome Jarrell Drumgool. 
is going to talk to us about another aspect of the environment, environment here in um, the remediation program. And Jarrell is a student at Morgan State University in Baltimore, and yes. he's majoring in civil engineering. But the important thing for us is, is that Jarrell is here doing a co-op. He's working here on the Space Center as part of his studies, and hopefully we'll come back here and work when he's done. So, Jarrell, <laughs> <laughs> tell us about the remediation program. And I know, let's start with, I, I, it's only been in the last few years that I knew what remediation meant. So can you tell us what remediation is? So a lot of people out there may not even know what that word means. What does that mean? Well... That's a great question. Our remediation pro <laughs> our remediation program pretty much consists of uh cleaning up the pollution or what we call contaminants in either our groundwater or our soils. Uh, we pretty much uh and you're probably wondering why does KSC has or Kennedy Space Center should I say mm -hmm. has uh contaminants in either our groundwater or soil. Yeah, where'd that stuff come from? That's a, another <laughs> great question. <laughs> And that, that is because back then we didn't have a full understanding of how solvents and different uh, types of chemicals affect our environment. So through the hard work of uh, different studies and different tests that uh, happened throughout the years, we have a better understanding. And our job is to pretty much clean up the past practices that we had here at KSC. So I think what you're saying is that in the early days of the space program, we didn't have an understanding so much of what would happen when we put our contaminants just In, into the ground, threw them out, right? Yes. Basically, we didn't have the, the technology that we have or the knowledge that we have now to take care of these things the way they should have been taken care of. And so now we're going back and taking care of it. Yes. <laughs> okay, so how do we go about doing that? Well, we have a, a process that we go through. Uh, pretty much that that finds the contaminants and one of the most common contaminants that we have here at KSC is a uh, TCE which is trichloroethylene and this is uh, the chemical structure of the trichloroethylene we have three uh, chlorines we have two uh, carbons that's double bonded and we have a hydrogen this is something that you would see in your chemistry class <laughs> uh, this was mainly used as a as a, it, this is a solvent that was mainly used to clean up uh, as a degreaser of, I guess, steel, and in our case, uh, rocket engines. Hmm. And one of the ways of disposal was to pour it into the ground, and little did we know it was creating a plume into our soils and groundwater. Okay. So, how do we go about figuring out where this stuff is and what to do about it? Well, the remediation uh, team has pretty much uh, standards that we go by to finding the different contaminants or pollutions. But then once we uh, actually go through and actually find a site, we'll use the direct push technology, which we call a DPT. And this is pretty much a drill rig, and it uh, collects samples in our groundwater and soils. With this drill, we are able to do high frequency samples. That means that we are able to uh, collect samples within increments of, I guess, 10 to 15. And we uh, collect these samples all the way to a depth of 45 uh, feet under underground hmm. and also this DPT is used to install our injection wells and also our uh, monitoring wells to see the the actual plume either dissipating or if it's uh, moving that way growing okay so that's that's what you that's the way you sample to see where the plume is and yes okay. and and I've had a sneak preview of a really cool thing that Jarrell brought with him it's a model Yes. So, turn it on. <laughs> okay, now, explain this to us. What we have here is uh, once we uh, use the DPT that I was just showing you earlier, we have uh, right here is all the sample points that we use to collect our data. Then our contractors will actually put together a, a program for us that's pretty cool. And as I was saying earlier, each dot is a sample point that we collected at a site. And once we, we uh, find out all the sample points, we can actually see the actual plume underground in a 3D model. And that big blue box is the source of the, of the original source of the pollution, right? Correct. Okay. And here goes the plume under the ground. Now, the cool thing about this is we get to see how the pollution uh, reacts in different types of soil. Now, the color of the plume indicates the depth 
of or how deep it is underground. So the blue is the shallow, shallow, and the red is the deepest. Now each cylinder that you see here shows the actual contaminants. The blue is the less concentrated, and as you get up into the green and red area, that's the more concentrated uh, contaminants or pollution. So the green and the red cylinders the pollution is more concentrated there than the blue, and you're shooting for the yes, blue. Yes, right? we're shooting for the blue. Now, we have to keep in mind that our target level for to indicate that it's clean is 3 micrograms per liter. And what we see in here is uh, some pollu pollution that is actually 300 micrograms per liter or even 3,000 micrograms per liter. So we're well above our target level, and we we're working on getting it to our target level now. So that site has a lot of work left to be done. Yes, this is actually one of the biggest sites in Florida. So this is actually a good study site. All right, that's, that's really interesting. So how do you clean this mess up? <laughs> what do you, what do you <laughs> physically do to take care of these things? Once you know where this stuff is and you know what it is and how bad it is, mm -hmm. what do you do? Well, the actual the program shows us how, the outline or mm -hmm. pretty much the deline delineation points. Once we find out the actual source area and we find out the delineation points, which is the surrounding area where the contaminants pretty much stop, mm -hmm. we actually go about it in several different ways. If it's soil uh, contaminants, we can uh, go about it by excavating it, pretty much digging up the soil, cleaning it up, and then putting it back where we found it. Another way of uh, cleaning up uh, either groundwater or soil is by using a bioremediation uh, remedy or a solution. Bioremediation uh, uh, is pretty much uh, injecting microorganisms into the ground and letting it eat up the, the pure stuff or the pure contaminants within the groundwater. And if that needs a little bit of help, we actually inject some type of food to help the microorganisms work uh, at its full capacity. Very good. Yeah, they can't work well without eating. Come on. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually one of the most common uh, things you would see here at Kennedy Space Center. This is how we uh, pretty much treat uh, a lot of our sites that has contaminants in the groundwater, and that's air sparging. The way air sparging works is we inject air into the groundwater, let it bubble up, and it sends off its volatiles or its uh, vapors into the, the soil and eventually into the atmosphere. By the time it hits the atmosphere, nine times out of ten, is harmless to humans mm -hmm. or in the environment. But if it was uh, a potential to be harmless, harmful to either humans or the environment, we would collect those vapors and send it off in a different way, as in steam or things okay. of that sort. All right, so... We have all these sites, and you told us how you find them and how you what what you figure out what's there and mm -hmm. and the different techniques to clean them up. So where do we stand? How are we doing? Well, as I was saying earlier, we have a, a actual process that we go through as a remediation team, and we break it down into different categories. And as you see on your screen, could we see that slide back? Thank you. Uh, we have total of two hundred and fourteen sites that's being investigated right now, or that has some type of remedy implemented in it right now. Uh, seven of them is in the investigation stage, which is the beginning stages of uh, our uh, pretty much investigation. Then we have our confirmed sampling, which is uh, we either find out if there are contaminants in the soil or groundwater or they're, they're not. And then once we uh, figure out that there are contaminants in the soil, we get into some in-depth sampling in which we use the diagram that I showed earlier and we find out the, the delineation points and also the source area. So th that's the, one of the biggest steps. Next, we would go into uh, determining a cleanup method, which uh, our remediation team would get together and figure out the best way of solving this problem. Once we uh, conclude with that, we try to implement it in, in, at that site. So, work. And so, 
from that you have 131 sites that either have met your target level of three micrograms per per liter per yeah. liter or are clean yes so that's pretty amazing i think uh, another thing i found to be amazing in that slide is that they currently have 40 sites that they're in they're cleaning up there's not that many people on the remediation team yeah there's about <laughs> five of us five or six of us uh -huh. so that's pretty much eight sites per uh, per person. Per, per yeah. person. Yeah, that's a lot of hard work, and um, it's nice to know that that we're going back and we're fixing some of our um, mistakes that were yes. made in the past, and, and uh, we're cleaning it up and making it better. So, yes. Thank you very much. Not a problem. The remediation team is working hard, and we're on track to get it cleaned up. Good job. Thank All you, right. Jarrell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm going to go into what I like to do my favorite stuff, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the wildlife here. Um, Kennedy Space Center has one of the longest running ecological data, ecological research programs um, that st it started in the 1970s before the space shuttle, and we have several long-term databases, and here's a few of them listed on the screen. I'm only going to talk about a couple of these today. And because I want to get into some other things that are operational, more operationally oriented. But all of these are long-term databases that have been around for at least five, six, ten years. Some of them, like I said, from the beginning, from the 70s. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are the marine turtles. We have three species of marine turtles that can occur here. The loggerhead, that's the most numerous, the Atlantic green turtle, and also the leatherback turtle. All three of these species are are listed under the Endangered Species Act, and uh, the loggerhead is listed as threatened, the green turtle and the leatherback are both listed as endangered. So the purpose of our, our program on the beach, the nesting beach, is to monitor the impacts of launch operations on the behavior of marine turtles. And if you don't know about marine turtles, what they do is in the beginning of the summer, the, at the spring, the sea turtles, the females, congregate offshore. and as the summer goes on, they come up on, they crawl up onto the beach and they dig a nest with their hind flippers and lay about a hundred eggs, cover the nest up and go back to the water. There's no parental care. And those eggs sit there in those nests for about 90 days. There's usually about a hundred eggs. They sit there for 90 days and all the hatchlings hatch out within the nest all at the same time. And when everybody's hatched out and everybody's ready to go, they all pop out of the nest at once and they do this at night. It's really an interesting uh, process and, and fun to watch. But here's what happens sometimes. In a perfect world, the world is dark, and the sea turtles hatch out of their nest at night, and it's dark, and they cue on the light that is reflecting off of the waves. And it might be moonlight or just even any kind of ambient light over the ocean. And they cue off of that, and they go down to the ocean. The little hatchlings crawl down there, and that's in the normal hatching event, you can see all those tracks, those are hundreds of little sea turtle tracks going down to the ocean. If you look at, this, at the picture right next to at that, that's a disorientation event. And what has happened is there are lights behind the dune or along the beach that the sea turtles, when they hatch out, they see it and they get confused and they don't go to the ocean. You can see how they walk around in circles, some of them go the wrong way, all sorts of things can happen. And, and when this happens, they can get lost, they can dry out, they can get eaten by predators, they can, if they get out on the road, like A1A behind there, they can uh, get run over by cars, just all kinds of bad things can happen to them. So you can see in this slide that we have light issues at the Space Center. We have places that have to be lit up. And these places are right along the beach. All of our launch pads are right along the beach. This is uh, the shuttle launch pads LC-39A and LC-39B. The top picture is what we call operational lighting. That's if there's a shuttle on the pad or something going on that requires all of the lights to be on and it's very, very bright and you can see that for miles. The bottom pictures are what we call task lighting and this is an, a, a, something that we've implemented over the last few years to try and cut down on the amount of lighting on the beach. And the idea is to only use lights when you absolutely have to have them. When you absolutely need them for a job, you turn those lights on and you can see how darker and how much better that is. 
So we are trying to get everyone to use task lighting, not just at the launch pads, but at all kinds of buildings all over the Space Center, because even some of our buildings that are inland can reflect out on the beach and can disorient sea turtles. Now, like I said, sometimes we have to have lights, and we need, we need the lights on for security, for safety of people out there working. So we have other methods of protecting those nests, and one of them is to shield the nest. You put the, you see the black screen. There's a nest right in front of that, and so when those hatchlings come out, they can't see those lights from that launch pad back there because that black net, that black netting stuff is protecting them from those lights, and that will keep them from being disoriented. You also see behind that on that railroad track is an old railroad car that's not being used. We had a thing called Operation Dark Dune where we had railroad cars pulled up between the nesting beach and the launch pads and that was good enough to block that light so that a lot of our nests did not get disoriented. One of the biggest things that we have to do is educate people. We have to educate facility managers, we have to educate KSC workers, um, people all in Brevard County are beginning to know about how important it is even at your house if you live near the beach and, and to turn out your lights and to make it a dark beach because otherwise we're going to lose lots of our sea turtles. And even if you lose just a few, when it's an endangered species, that's a big deal. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the marine turtles in the estuary. Remember I pointed out on that first map that those white areas, the Indian River Lagoon estuary, and that's brackish water, very, very important areas because there's so much plant life and animal life in there. So the purpose of our lagoon program is to assess the population status and health of the marine turtles in one part of that, the Mosquito Lagoon. And this began, this is one of those long-term data sets that began in the 1970s. And how do, you, how do you assess a population of animals in a huge body of water like that? Well, we put out boats, two or three boats with big tangle nets across the water and the sea turtles swim into the nets and we go out and we get them and tag them, figure out what sex they are, take blood from them sometimes. Sometimes we put different kinds of uh, tags on them so that when we see them again, we'll recognize them. And in the 19, some things we found out from this long-term data set, in the 1970s, the most common turtle that we had out there were loggerheads. But now, when we go out and do this, it's flipped. Green turtles are the predominant species. So there's way more green turtles now than there were before. Another thing that we found in, in Brevard County in 1980 was this disease. It's been found in other places like Hawaii before, but we started seeing this disease called fibropapilloma. It's called, we think it's caused by a virus. And it's those um, wart-looking things down on that turtle's flipper. It gets on their soft parts, not on the shell, but it gets on their, their soft parts of the turtles. It can grow across their face and in their eyes. It's, it's very debilitating, particularly when it gets in their eyes or, and they can't see to feed. So we never saw fibropapilloma in our lagoons until 1980, and now the current infection rate in Mosquito Lagoon is 54% of the turtles that we pull out of the water have fibropapilloma, which is really high. We think it it's, has something to do with water quality. Um, we're not sure, and that's being studied now, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on for sure. This year we had something really interesting happen. Um, we had our 2010 cold stun event. Now sea turtles are reptiles, which means they're cold blooded. They have no means of regulating their own body temperature. The only way they can regulate their body temperature is to go someplace warm when they want to be warm or go someplace cool when they need to be cool. So in January of this year we had 10 days of water temperatures less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I know for you people watching from up north, you're thinking, ugh, that's nothing. But for Central Florida to have the water temperatures less than 50 degrees is, is a big deal. And so what we started seeing were sea turtles coming up to the surface of the water, what we call a stranding. And these animals could not swim. Some of them were already dead. They were almost comatose, most of them. You could just go right up to them and pick them up. So between January 6th and January 14th, we had over 2,000 sea turtles wash up like that. It was an amazing event because most of the sea turtles that we found were green turtles. Most of them were juvenile turtles. And it took hundreds of people working, and there 18 different organizations working 
to pick all of these turtles up, take them to one central point on Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, determine whether they needed medical care, determine if they could go back into the water immediately or if they needed to be rehabilitated. We had about 19% mortality, so a couple of hundred turtles died in that event. But if we had not conducted this rescue, the mortality would have certainly been almost 100%. It was, it was an amazing thing. We also got lots and lots of good data. Every turtle was measured, every turtle was tagged, every turtle, um, some turtles had blood samples taken, some had tissue samples taken. So we got a lot of really good data that's gonna help us figure out even more about our sea turtle populations. And some of them had different kinds of, of transmitters put on them, and even some had satellite transmitters. So we'll be able to follow those pretty much wherever they go. I want to move on to a totally different kind of critter. And these are the wading birds. Your wading birds are your egrets, your big birds, your egrets, your ibises, um, um, wood storks. The, the, the small picture is the wood stork, and that's a federally endangered species. Six of those wading bird species are what we call species of special concern, and they're listed by the state of Florida. This is another long-term data set. We began the data collection in 1987, and we used a, a helicopter to survey large areas of feeding habitat. Now, one thing, you, in order to understand wading bird populations on KSC, you have to understand how these areas, these feeding areas, came about. Now, in the old days, <laughs> before the Space Center was the Space Center, we had salt marshes here. And these salt marshes just ran into the estuary. They were almost, it was water and land and there was nothing in between them. But we have a mosquito here called the salt marsh mosquito and they are wicked. And in fact, Brevard County used to be called Mosquito County. And when NASA bought the property, they realized that they, there was no way they were gonna be able to have people out here working and getting anything done, battling mosquitoes all the time. They were so terrible. So what they decided to do was take a machine, and if you look at that thing, this is what we call an impoundment, and it's an old marsh. And what they did was they dug a ditch around the edge of the marsh and built it up, built a dike around the edge of the marsh, and basically sealed it off from the estuary so that it was no longer getting that estuarine water in there. And it, uh, they could pump water into that marsh or they could just let rainwater come in there and fill it up and the water would stay. Now our salt marsh mosquitoes aren't like regular mosquitoes. They don't lay their eggs in water. They lay their eggs in mud. So if you kept that marsh flooded, if you kept that impoundment flooded, then the mosquitoes couldn't lay their eggs. And it worked really, really well. It cut down on the number of mosquitoes that were coming out. It worked really great, but after many, many years, we started seeing some, some pretty serious ecological effects from that. If you look at the two pictures with, that are, are pretty much green, uh, those are, that's one impoundment where it's been impounded since the early 60s. And these are pictures in 1997 before they were reconnected to the estuary. And what you see there is basically a field of cattail. Cattail uh, is a native species, but it tends to, when it's in a disturbed area, it tends to just become really, really thick. No wading bird can feed in there. Alligators don't like it that much. Lots and lots of animals can't go in there because it's basically a monoculture, one kind of plant. There's not much variety of food or anything else. So they decided in, in the late 90s to start reconnecting some of these impoundments to the estuary using culverts. And that way the brackish water could come back in and they could um, get more of a natural system going again. So it, this is the same area in April of 2002. And what do you see? You see it, not hardly any cattail at all, which is great. You see areas of open water, you see some mud, you see different kinds of plants. There's a lot more variety. And that type of, of system is much healthier than the pure cattail marsh. This is what happens with wading birds. You see in 19, the very first dot around 1987, I believe, is when we started these samples. We had a decent number of birds feeding. This is for one impoundment. We had a decent number of birds feeding in there. But after 20, 25 years of being disconnected from the estuary, the cattail started moving in and the number of wading birds dropped off. And it really went down to almost zero. But then in the late 90s, this impoundment was reconnected and as you can see, the number of wading birds has gone up and that trend has continued even now. That, that impoundment is much more healthy. It's got the 
the uh, estuarine water coming in and out, and it works really well. We're getting back to a more natural system. We also look at wading bird nesting, and I just wanted to talk about this for a minute because it shows the value of having these long-term data sets. Um, usually on any given year, we'll have around 3,000, an average of 3,000 nests, wading bird nests. These birds nest in colonies on the islands, and we go out and count them either in a boat or on, on the helicopter. And you can see it's pretty steady. But then in 1990, we had a year where that dots almost up to the top of the graph, and there was 11,000 nests. Most of those were white ibis, and that's a picture of an immature white ibis right there. So the value of having long-term data set like this is it shows us these fluctuations. What if the only year we ever went out and sampled was in 1990? We would think that we had way more wading birds than we really do. Or it also says maybe it's important, for at least for white ibis, that every few years, every 30, 40 years, they have a really great year where they put most of their um, their reproductive output comes in that year, and that's what keeps the population stable. So these long-term data sets will be able to tell us if that's true, or it could have been just a fluke. We don't know. Now I want to talk about some short, shorter-term studies, things that have just started or are meant to be short-term. One of the things that we're looking at now are alligators. We have known for years and years and years this place has been famous for having big, lots of big alligators, but we never had collected any data on them. We knew nothing about their health or, or anything else. And alligators are a, a top predator. That means they eat everything. And if you know anything about bioaccumulation, if you have pollution or you have problems in your environment, the plants will suck it up out of the ground or the smaller animals will eat things, eat the plants, and then whatever eats those smaller animals as you go up the food chain, those problems are magnified so that by the time you get to your top predator, if you have uh, toxins or metals or something like that in, in your food chain, you'll be able to tell it from the alligators. So we, wanted, we really wanted to get a good handle on, on how healthy our alligators were. And we wanted to look at those data compared to other places around Florida. We have one, one control area that is very, it's on another wildlife refuge. It's very clean. It's our, it's our beautiful, pristine place. And then we have an, a lake that we're looking at to compare to that we know is polluted and has been polluted for many years. So we're looking at those three populations of alligators. So... This has been going on about three years, and so what have we found so far? Well, we were right. We have lots of alligators. That's not a staged photo on top. That's alligator after alligator after alligator laying on a bank. It must have been cold water and nice warm sun that day because alligators are reptiles too, and they like to stay warm when the water's cold. We found that the average home range size is 150 acres. That's pretty, pretty good size for an animal that crawls around on its belly or swims through the water, 150 acres. And the nice thing is that we're finding that our nest success, in other words, how many of our eggs that get laid actually hatch out and produce alligators, our nest success on Kennedy Space Center is higher than the, those other Florida populations, even the pristine place. And if you have successful reproduction, then you can, you can pretty much assume that things are good. You, you, can't, you can't say everything's perfect, but at least the population is healthy enough that it's reproducing and that it will carry on. We look at vultures. Aren't those beautiful? We have two kinds of vultures here, the black vulture and the turkey vulture. And a lot of people don't like vultures because they're not very pretty and they have some pretty disgusting habits like eating dead things. But if we didn't have vultures, we'd probably be knee-deep in dead things. So, But we do have issues with vultures. That top picture is a vulture and vulture excrement, let's say that. And when a vulture, for lack of a better word, poops on metal, it's very caustic and it will eat pockmarks into a lot of metal things and tear them up. And so when it sits on things like lighting fixtures or bleachers, it can ruin them. Vultures like particular smells from particular kinds of rubber and plastic and they will get on your car and tear up your lining around your windshield, or they will sit on rooftops and pick at the roof, and they will pick it, and you get a whole bunch of vultures, they'll pick at the roof so bad that it, it will eventually start leaking. And all of those things are not good, and they're annoying. But we also had, about three years ago, had an incident where a vulture 
actually ran into the flew, not ran, flew into the space shuttle liftoff. The shuttle was taking off, taking off slowly, and the vulture ran right into the side of it. No, he did not survive. He went everywhere. But it was a very serious situation. He damaged some tiles, and if depending on where the vulture hit on a shuttle, it could have been much more serious than it was. This, this did not cause a problem, but it was something that we definitely had to look at to investigate and decide what we were going to do about the vultures, or what we could learn about the vultures to help. So we tried a couple of different things. Um, one of the things was, as I said, vultures eat dead things. So we started the roadkill roundup, and we had a big campaign that people could call in on their way into work or whenever they were driving around the Space Center, if they saw dead animals in the road, that they could pick them up or call, not pick them up, they could call somebody who would come and pick them up and get them off the road. And the idea was that if you got rid of the food source, then maybe our vulture population would go down because we have lots of vultures. But you see on that bottom sign, we have the roadkill roundup number on the sign and the vultures are sitting on it on top. I think they were pretty much laughing at us. Um, we tried some tracking, different kinds of tracking, doing some research. That picture on the other side on the top is a vulture trap. And what you do is you put bait, dead stuff, in the trap. The vultures walk in. They're not really smart enough to figure out how to get back out. So we go in and we grab the vultures. We measure them. We put tags on them. The, the white tag on the vulture on the bottom is an, a tag so that if you see that vulture, you can identify him. And that's a way to start getting an idea of the population numbers and how far they travel. We also put some radio tags on them that were short distance, and we even had a couple of tags, satellite tags, which was really cool, and it taught, those two satellite tags taught us a whole lot. These are, the different colors are two vultures that were tagged out on Kennedy Space Center, which is to the far right of that picture in the map, the green vulture and the orange vulture. And as you can see, they were tagged on Kennedy Space Center, but they sure as heck didn't stay there. They went all over the place, and they flew very, very long distances, and they moved a lot. This is just a couple of months' worth of data. They moved a whole lot, all the time, moving back and forth and coming back to the Space Center and then going back to the mainland. In fact, the orange vulture basically moved all the way, halfway across the state of Florida and came back. So what this tells us is that if we're going to put money into vulture research, what we need to do is put more satellite tags on because putting a little tag, a little white tag with numbers on it on a vulture and expecting that you're going to see it very often is just not reasonable. Or putting a short distance radio tag on a vulture is not good because you're just not going to keep up with an animal that way. I want to talk real quick about some climate change things. That's the big issue now all over the place, um, all over the world, and we're keeping up. Um, I was very surprised to read this from the Defenders of Wildlife uh, pamphlet called Refuges at Risk in 2006. Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge was identified as one of the top 10 endangered national wildlife refuges due to threats from climate change. And our big threat here is sea level rise. This is a, uh, this map is a model from the University of Arizona that predicts that in 50 years that our water levels here will have risen one meter, which is around three, a little bit more than three feet. And if you look at this, there we are, red is in 50 years underwater, and there we are at Kennedy Space Center, and we're basically underwater. There's, we're going to be inundated with water from the ocean and also water from the freshwater St. John's River to our west. So this is um, something that we're taking very seriously. We're already starting to see the effects of sea level rise here on the Space Center. Uh, that long piece of, uh, it's a railroad track. If you can see that going down, the, going down the middle of the picture, that railroad track it was used for many, many years to transport materials back and forth to the launch pad. It's not being used anymore, which is a good thing because all of that sand has, is pl are places where it's been overwashed. That track's been overwashed by sand in just normal storm events. So the sea is getting rougher, the sea is coming up higher, it's overwashed. And we had a conference here last month in May where a bunch of us here from Kennedy and from NASA headquarters in Washington and from several of the centers, the NASA centers, came and met in Cocoa Beach and we talked about what are we going to do here at Kennedy about 
sea level rise and in general about climate change because not only do we have lots of launch pads along the beach and other facilities that we're going to have to talk about how to protect these facilities from sea level rise, but also we have a lot of wildlife issues. When we're losing that much habitat and things are going to be underwater, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? We're talking about our sea turtle nesting beach. We're talking about habitat for lots and lots of animals in those dunes. How are we going to, how are we going to deal with this? And I'm happy to say there were lots of out of the box ideas and lots more to come on that. So, but I've probably jabbered enough, and it's time to move on to something else. And I have with me, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Lynn Phillips. Lynn is a physical scientist. Scientist, thank you. <laughs> physical scientist. She's with NASA's environmental planning branch, and she's going to talk to us about something. It really is our future, one important part of our future, and she's going to talk to us about that. And I'm going to do you just like I did Jarrell. A few years ago, I did not have a clue uh, anything about sustainability. What does that mean? So tell us, she's going to talk to us about sustainability, but explain to us what that means. Well, basically, it's the abil ability to endure. Environmentally, it's the ability for us to act in a way that meets the needs of today without impacting our future generation's ability to meet their needs. That's good. I like that. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds good. So what do we do here? What do we do on Kennedy? Well, we, sustainability has a lot of aspects. And here uh, we have a couple of recycling programs. One is the employee recycling program. And we do a couple of things. One is office supplies. We, we uh, recycle paper, cardboard, and toner cartridges. We also uh, recycle common items that you might recycle at home, plastic, glass, and aluminum. Our program generated $13,000 in 2009, and all that money goes back into the recycling fund. That's good, because I have um, been in other facilities. Our building's all decked out. We have recycling bins. <laughs> <laughs> we have places to put our plastic and our glass and our toner cartridges and everything, and but I've been other facilities where I've thought, oh, man, this place, this place needs bins. This place needs, why don't they have this stuff? But I guess the program didn't have enough money to outfit everybody, but they're working toward that. That's correct. And this, the, the funds that we generate help to buy more of these bins so everybody who has a desk can have a recycle bin. And we don't have to scrap our paper in, into the landfill. It can go into recycling. That's great. Yeah, we even do cardboard. I like that. <laughs> Yes, Becky recycles a lot of cardboard. cardboard. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but we also have an industrial program. We, uh, as Becky said, we're, we've been around for almost 50 years, and we have a lot of older buildings, a lot of older structures. So there are a lot of buildings we don't use anymore, and we are demolishing them. Part of the demolition plan is to include an industrial recycling plan. And some of the items we recycle are scrap metal and concrete. Those are actually the largest. And then everything else on this list, green waste being similar to yard waste. Right. The concrete, we have an example here of how we recycle concrete. The building on the top left is the VPF. That's the, it's an old processing facility that is no longer in use and we have no future need for it. So we put it on the list came up with a demo plan, segregated all the different materials that we recycle, including concrete, and then we transported the concrete to the concrete yard. The concrete yard is actually the diverted aggregate recycled concrete yard, affectionately called the Darcy. <laughs> you can see why. And that's where the concrete goes to wait until we have a project where we can reuse it. Well, we also had a recent project. We had an issue along our NASA causeway, which crosses from the mainland over to the visitor center and to KSC. So all you who come to visit us will cross over this bridge and this causeway, and you'll see our new uh, shoreline protection. We had to develop a shoreline protection plan because we were having some erosion problems from wind and rain. The engineers designed a what's called a revetment a rock revetment, which is also a sloped rock wall, and it requires various sizes of rocks. 
So we determined that we, we would be able to use the concrete that we, from our demolition projects, on this project. But they had to be crushed into the, the correct sizes. So on the bottom right of this screen, you'll see the uh, crushers <laughs> and uh, the bucket and the crushers. And anyway, they were able to uh, break these down into the appropriate small, medium, large sizes. We trucked the, these um, rocks over to, this, to the causeway and constructed the shoreline protection. And this is a very successful project that, in many ways. Yeah, that's really great. So what else do we do out here? Well, every year we have a KSC All-American picnic and in 08 we decided to go green. So <clears throat> going green meant uh, using all of, our, all of our utensils, our plates, our cups, everything is now either biodegradable or recyclable. Very good. So you'll see in the top left hand uh, picture the scouts are helping us collect the recyclables. We then take them by truck to a facility, which is in the bottom right hand corner. That's the facility where they turn our recyclable, recyclable material into mulch. And we, we, Disney World, Walt Disney World here in Orlando actually util, utilizes this mulch on their property. And mulch might not be pretty, but it's a very functional item. I'm not thinking that mulch is out where the guests are going to see it, but I'm, I'm, I do believe that they're using that mulch for all kinds of different things. And mulch is invaluable for keeping your plants healthy and, and conserving water and things like that. So um, Yes, it holds the moisture right, in. It holds the moisture in great. So Excellent. That's really good. And I think another thing that happened as a result of greening the picnic was... The cafeteria has gone green. Yeah. We have many cafeterias here, actually, and very recently they said, well, we want to get on board and we're going to change how we do business and they've gone green. The items that um, these two folks are holding are um, not styrofoam containers, they're cardboard, paper cups, and biodegradable cups. The, the plastic cups are actually made from a corn product. Mm -hmm. And the straws biodegradable. Yep. The napkins are made from recycled paper. Yeah. And, and the poster on the other side is um, encouraging everyone that uses the cafeteria, which is thousands of people every single day, um, to buy a plastic mug and reuse it instead of using tons and tons of styrofoam. We used to go in there and everything that they had was styrofoam, and now it's rare that you ever even see a piece of styrofoam in our cafeteria, so that's great. That's yes. really been a big step. Oh, this is exciting. Tell us about this. <laughs> Another way we're, we're sustaining is going green. We've talked about how we're demolishing older buildings, but we're also constructing new buildings, and this is one of our green projects. It's an eco-friendly and energy efficient building. That's the architect's rendering in the background, and in the foreground there is a picture of the building under construction. This building will have... Oops, sorry, <laughs> I'll go back to the other slide, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's got... Um, it's got a, the roof, the green roof there that you see is made out of recycled metal. It will have a solar water heating system on, on the top and of course it will heat the water that comes out of our faucets. It also collects the rainwater. We call it a rainwater harvesting system and we will use that water to flush the toilets and to water the landscape. And it's going to have zero scape, which is good, which means it's the, the plants and the, and the varieties of plants that they're going to use are going to be native, but they're also going to be very drought tolerant, so they're not going to have to have a lot of water. We're not going to be seeing sprinklers running out there a lot of the time using up water. So we're being water efficient. It's energy efficient. They've got the state-of-the-art air conditioning system, lighting systems. The windows were positioned in a way to receive the most light, and they're high efficiency, and they have a reflective surface. And they're to, big. <laughs> to reflect the heat. And yes, they are very big. Right. Very big. Oh, one more thing. We used more concrete from the Darcy here. Oh, that's great. The bedding for the foundation of that building was made from concrete from the Darcy. Very good. Well, that's beautiful. I'd be willing. I'm, I'm excited to see what that building looks like when it's done. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, we we expect it to be 52 percent more efficient than 
a normal building. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Okay, this is an, another exciting thing that's happened in the last couple of years. And Lynn, tell us about this. This is our solar energy project. We also are looking for alternative energy sources. This is a renewable energy resource, solar power. I think we're all somewhat familiar with solar power. And it is a renewable energy source, which means it's uh, readily replenished because it's natural. And we partnered with a local power company, Florida Power and Light, to allow them to build a 10 megawatt power site for themselves. And in return, they built a one megawatt site for us. So together, we have an 11 megawatt solar power site. Right. It's operational. If you combine the two, they generate enough power to supply 2,000 American homes. Wow. Now, I want you to explain to us where they, where they put this, because I've already told these people that we have lots and <laughs> lots of undeveloped property out here that's, that's set aside for wildlife and that's managed for wildlife. So when you're talking about the acres and acres, and I think it was 200 acres, I'm thinking, that it took to put that solar energy site how did we how do we do that? How did we decide taken away from the wildlife? <laughs> well, we didn't use natural habitat. We used disturbed habitat. It used to be citrus grove. Ah. We we have actually quite a bit of old citrus grove here on KSC. It's, and it's instead not being of, used anymore. And it's not being right. used. We've mm -hmm. allowed it to go fallow. And fallow means we're not using it and we're not managing it. So it's getting overgrown with weeds and it doesn't provide any value to the wildlife or right. minimal value to the wildlife. So we converted the groves to our new solar power energy site. That's great. Okay, so I hope that, do we have any questions, Damon? Do we have time for questions? Oh, here's a question from Kurt. Kurt wants to know, Kurt from Hampton, Virginia. Kurt wants to know why the vulture ran into the shuttle. Well, as I told you when I was talking about trapping, vultures aren't very smart. They'll go into a trap and they will um, not be able to figure out how to come get back out. So it ran into the shuttle just because it didn't know any better. When the, when the shuttle starts to blast off, it, there's a lot of gas, there's a lot of noise, a lot of vibration, and it, um, it just went the wrong way at the wrong time. So it's not something that's going to happen a lot or happen very often, but um, we still needed to look at that to see how, um, how we could help avoid this problem with the shuttle ever happening again. So... Well, Becky, I can't tell you how much I appreciated you guys come by. I've lived here my whole life. I grew up on the uh, really? going to the wildlife refuge, going to play on a beach uh, with my parents, and I learned a lot today. So I'm really glad you guys came by. I uh, learned a few things. I uh, learned uh, about Darcy uh, <laughs> also, and I think my neighbor's yard is fallow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Right. Should we put a solar site there? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, we have a, uh, a couple of guests. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd like to call uh, Lynn and, uh, and Jarrell. Uh, Jarrell back uh, up on here and come kind of get in behind us. And you guys have something here. Uh, I'm a little nervous. Come on, come on camera, both of you. <laughs> Step in behind us. And, oh, that's uh, good. I now, like that. <laughs> this thing is not going to bite me, is it? It could. It has teeth, but it won't. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, a... Uh, these are corn snakes. Corn snakes. They're a common species here in this, not only here, but all in, in, okay. the, in the southeast. They are, um, they eat rodents, so they're good to have around for pest okay. control. Okay. They're, they're, these are, these are mine that I take around for educational purposes, so we, uh, so they're well tame and it's pretty chilly in here so they're not going to be moving too fast they're reptiles as well so um i think that what i what i'd like to say is that kennedy space center is such a unique place and and it's it's unusual to meet somebody who's actually besides our children that were actually born here you know <laughs> that somebody at our age is actually born and raised here so you know what a unique place it is and and how interesting and how um wonderful it is. So what I'd like to do is invite you, all of you people out there watching, to come visit us. 
You can come here and you can go to the visitor center at Kennedy Space Center and learn everything you could possibly want to know about space and astronauts and rockets and all that stuff. And you can also, in the same day, go to Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. They have an incredible um, visitor center there. They have wildlife drives. They have a beautiful undeveloped beach, Canaveral National Seashore. So and you can find out all about the, the wildlife resources and the natural habitats and nature that you could possibly, just all these things all in, all in one day. And I would highly encourage you on spring break or over the summer, whenever, just to come down here and, and visit us. And I think you'll be surprised at, at how wonderful it really is. Because this is, this is really one of the few places, it's the only place that I know of where we have rockets and going, going into space and people living in space, which has got to be humans' highest technological achievement. That's, that's got to be it. At the same time, married to these incredible natural resources and it all works and we make it work and, and we all take care of each other and everybody has their priorities, but we all work together and I just think that's incredible. <laughs> all right, thanks Becky. Thank and you. Uh, hopefully you fed Thank you this uh, guy recently. Oh, I think she's hungry. <laughs> okay, yeah. And so uh, I'll be signing off from here at uh, NASA's Digital Learning Network at the Kennedy Space Center. So bye, everybody. Bye.